familiar with the foundation and e-health initiative we've been around for 20 years this is our 20 year anniversary and we convene executives who are transforming healthcare through technology and innovation and this afternoon is just a great example of how we do that with executives and we work with a whole group of different folks across the spectrum of healthcare right now um, the next slide is just a sampling of some of the different organizations that we work with right now if you do not see your company's name up there, it should be up there. We work with the most influential groups um, in healthcare right now, um, and obviously um, focused on all different sorts of issues related to healthcare and technology, uh, particularly around COVID-19 right now. There's a lot of interesting um, things happening in the policy and, and also practice. So um, we would love to have you um, engage with us. Next slide. So we primarily do work around transparency, interoperability, privacy, and analytics. We have a huge project going on right now around healthcare privacy and building a consumer framework for privacy, really related to the topic we're going to talk about here today. A number of initiatives around social determinants of health right now, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, um, and a whole lot of work around um, cost transparency um, and really understanding pricing. Next slide. We have focused primarily over the last 12 weeks on how all these different areas intersect around COVID-19. And we launched probably about uh, 15 webinars over the last 12 weeks having to do with um, COVID-19. And we have a couple of really interesting ones coming up this week. Um, Thursday, I'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Patrick James, who's the Chief Clinical Officer of Quest Diagnostics, all about testing and how testing is going to help get people back to work and back to school and a great conversation with him. So make sure you register for that one. Um, we've got another one coming up next week around contact tracing apps and um, privacy concerns with those. Um, another really exciting technology issue right now that we encourage you to get involved, learn about, and get your questions asked out there. And then finally, on June 11th, we're going to be talking about after the curve flattens and what's next for healthcare and COVID-19. Really a great lineup of programs. If you're interested in sponsoring something, you don't see a topic up there or in our um, resource center that you're interested in, please reach out to myself um, through the chat today or reach out to Amy at EHIDC and we will respond to you and get you involved. Um, we work with um, really about 26,000 um, different executives across the industry have been attending our programs, come to our programs, um, and we have a pretty extensive network. So we would love to get you involved and help get your um, program or, or, or thoughts out there and perspectives. So please let us know. And now I'm really excited to also just turn it over to PwC. But before I do that, I really want to thank PwC. Um, they've done a tremendous job. And as I mentioned, um, Sarah Haplett and um, HRI has done great work with us over the last 10 years. And we're just always delighted to have them come back on and talk about their surveys. And I think you're in for a real treat this afternoon. They do just great work. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Ben, I think, first. Yes, great. Thank you, thank you, Jen, and thanks for that uh, lead up and, and introduction. I think you, you know, I think you were hitting on something that's really important and timely. Coming off of this weekend, not only have we are we seeing the pandemic being experienced in the United States and some opening back up and what that may mean for consumers, but we're also seeing a lot around disparities in America, and and we can't forget that disparities touch the health system as well. Um, and so our jobs, all of us on this call, are extremely important, um, and, and, and it shows why it's important to also think about what consumers are experiencing and what they actually can experience in their own homes and their community, because only if we understand that can we build interventions that will really work and reduce health disparities in America. So with that, um, I just want to let you all know a little bit about our, our research. Um, well, here's us again as our uh, as presenters. Um, but let's go on to um, our, our research uh, in terms of what you're going to be seeing in this first portion. Um, these are survey results from our consumer survey that we ran the beginning of April. We also have some questions that we asked prior to the pandemic so we can see some compare and contrast. Um, and one thing I'll just mention as we jump in is that I think a lot of the high level things are known, right? Um, 
has telehealth exploded? You know, yes, it has. And, you know, there's some generalizations out there. But the reality is you can't create good interventions and change the world unless you get down into the specificity. And I think this consumer survey does that. We're not just talking about the generalities, but we're getting into the people and what their experiences are. And I think you'll see that through the survey data. And then you're going to get the extra special treat, which is um, um, Sundar and Sierra are going to then talk about when you take data like this and add it to other types of data, can you actually start to have a more predictive model to help you get ahead of these issues? And we'll have some discussion around that as well. So Sarah Halfler, I'll kick it off to you to hit the first um, slide over these next uh, 10 or so minutes. Sounds good. Thanks, Ben. And hello, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well on this Monday. So um, as Ben said, we look at you know, a lot of different aspects of consumer behavior as it relates to the pandemic, um, including you know, some behavior that was happening before the pandemic hit so that we could kind of compare and contrast. Um, we wanted to first get a real good sense uh, or as good a sense as we could at that point of uh, how consumers were changing, if at all, their behavior around spending on health care, uh, on visits, uh, you know, electric procedures, routine visits for chronic illness, wellness visits, um, screenings, et cetera, um, as well as prescriptions when they're, they're, um, they're spending on prescription drugs. And as you can see from on, on the next slide, our two pie graphs here show that um, certainly consumer behavior has been influenced. And I think obviously uh, you know, providers know that because uh, they, we're not seeing a lot of volumes come in and, and most providers were closed to elective procedures to begin with um, as the pandemic um, continued. Some are you know, just starting to, to reopen to that. Um, but what we found in our survey was that 22% of consumers overall and 31% of consumers um, uh, said that they were changing their, their behavior. So 22% saying that they were going to change their spending behavior on medication, 31% saying that they were going to spend, uh, change their behaviors um, in spending on health care visits. And so what we wanted to do is kind of, you know, peel the onion and look at, so what, how were they changing, you know? How are they changing their spending? Were they looking to increase spending? Were they looking to delay spending, you know, delay certain procedures, et cetera? And the way that it all broke down was that it, it was quite a mix. Um, but I think um, what was most notable was that those folks with chronic disease, we look at this by health status, those with chronic disease, um, complex chronic or, um, you know, just uncomplicated chronic disease, were the most likely uh, among consumers to say that they already had or planned to skip elective procedures or recommended tests or screens. So definitely concerning that folks that are already um, struggling to manage um, you know, a disease and uh, make sure that their adherence to their doctor visits, 30% uh, of them were saying that they, they were going to skip those procedures, skip those screenings. Medicare consumers were more likely to say that they would be skipping chronic uh, routine visits for chronic illness and, and electric procedures. Um, so, um, you know, looking at who is kind of coming back into the system, rescheduling visits, um, you know, certainly that particular group, um, providers are going to need to reach out to you directly to make sure that they are getting the routine care that they need as things reopen and as it becomes safer to um, come into the doctor's office. Um, but, we, you know, we don't know what the longer-term effects are going to be from those delays, um, and it will be interesting to see how that kind of all plays out. Um, I will say that about 60% of consumers that, that said that they uh, received in-hospital or in-office treatments like chemotherapy or, or some type of infusion or dialysis said that they had delayed or their doctor was delaying treatment. Um, so uh, it, it all remains to be seen, um, you know, lo the longer-term impact on health of these delays. Um, as it relates to medication, uh, you know, we saw we saw a lot of a, a lot of differences here, um, but particularly again around those with complex chronic diseases, they were the most likely to say that they would stretch their medications by skipping doses. Um, so you know, right there, looking at um, you know, potentially. Uh, longer-term impact of um, skipping doses, stretching that medication. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll start to see that um, improve uh, as, as, as things become safer, things start to open up, feel, people feel safer about going into the pharmacy. 
9% of the consumers that said they were adjusting their, their medication spending said that they had stopped taking their medications altogether to save money. So I think we see sort of the impact, uh, the economic you know, impact of COVID-19 as well as the, the fear factor there as well. Um, you know, if we take a quick glimpse to the future, we did ask some questions about, um, you know, for the future, um, what are you thinking about as, as, you know, just kind of philosophically uh, about the healthcare system and, and utilization of healthcare and medications? And we did find that a number of consumers really across the board uh, told us that they um, plan to think twice about asking your doctor for a prescription the next time they get sick. Um, and then we saw also a, a, a significant amount of consumers saying that they would start to consider more over-the-counter options. Um, so interesting to, to kind of think of the here and now um, and as things reopen, um, but also kind of the longer term sort of, you know, do I really need that medication? Do I really need that doctor visit? Um, and so I'll stop there and, um, and then yeah. you might have a, a couple yeah, no. to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. And while that's happening, just so I know there's there's some questions out there. I mean, we're we're going through a lot more data points than we're going to show you on slides. Otherwise, this would be a 50 slide presentation. But all, everything that we're talking about is freely available in more detailed decks on the um, um, on our website. And Sarah, if you if you don't mind, I'll, we'll just do a little ping pong here just in our time slot. Um, you know, I mentioned at the, at the top of the at the top of the call the explosion in, in, in telehealth, and what our survey showed is about five percent of Americans use telehealth for the very first time uh, during the pandemic, and that and that works out to about 17 million um, Americans, and so that's an incredible number of absolute first-time users. And I think one of the things you can see here. Are you know who are those new users? What does that breakdown look like? What kind of health status do they have? And um, you know, almost 70% of the new users of telehealth have a chronic or complex chronic condition as kind of as their primary health issue. About 12% said mental health was their primary health issue. Of course, some of these you could have you could have a mix um, as well of of issues. And I think this is a, another turning point that we see in telehealth, um, that it's not just being used for, for just, you know, people that need just basic primary care that have sniffles and sore throats, but the people during the pandemic that needed actual chronic care management and sometimes complex chronic care management or mental health management were using telehealth um, for the very first time. And I think that, that just brings up this incredible point about, you know, how are we going to treat and deliver care going forward to people with these conditions, especially knowing that something like mental health, um, the, the rate of people keeping their appointments when it's a telehealth visit is actually tends to be higher than when it's an in-person visit. So it's really interesting findings there around um, telehealth. And if we can go on to the next slide, I'll take it back to you, Sarah. Great, and, um, and I'm glad that you pointed out mental health there too, Ben, because I think there we're seeing opportunities kind of across this consumer survey um, that there are you know, opportunities to kind of reach that mental health consumer group um, as well. Um, and, and so we'll get into a little bit of that. So on the next slide, um, you know, what we found is that employers are actually seem to be stepping up in many ways um, as it relates to offering their employees uh, additional benefits during the pandemic to help them manage through the pandemic. Um, and what you can see from the graphic here is that, um, you know, most of, most of the consumers are, are saying that their um, employers are offering them work from home options or offering them information about how to cope with the pandemic, such as health advice or, you know, offering them expanded sick leave, more flexibility. Um, what, we, what we saw and thought is really an opportunity uh, going forward as folks as folks return to work, re return to the workplace, and, um, and just thinking about the stress and anxiety that and uncertainty that uh, employees have had uh, during this time and are still certainly having, um, only 8% of, of our employed consumers that we surveyed said that they had been offered a new mental health or stress-related benefit from their employer. Um, and we know that the number of employers have invested um, and new mental health benefits and sort of a menu of services around mental health um, over the last few years. But 
Um, we still see that, that is, there's a, a big opportunity for employers to um, you know, really connect with their employees and offer them more services related to mental health. Um, you know, as whether they're home, you know, working from home with, with all their children at home with them and trying to homeschool, or they're coming back to work and, and they have some fear and anxiety around that. So well, as we go, yeah, well, I think, I think our, our next one is interesting. This gets at the heart of so much of what we need to do here in the U.S., which is addressing the social determinants of health um, on the next slide. Uh, and this is one where we, we did ask some of these same questions prior to COVID-19 and then some dur and asked the same set of questions um, during. You know, there's many things to address when it comes to social determinants. I think a lot of people have focused, a lot of countries, a lot of communities have focused on things like nutrition and diet and exercise. Um, and those are all extremely important. I think we've seen a few items spike and um, during the, the, the pandemic, um, feelings of loneliness. I think that makes a lot of sense. That gets really amplified at a time when you're supposed to be social distancing. Um, too much time spent on technology. Again, this is probably a real true amplification of the isolation. I think you know many of those who have children, like myself, you know when they're uh, you're trying to keep them busy during the day while you're working, and um, uh, you know screens become that for um, many of our kids. Limited choice of healthy food options and ability to um, uh, get to um, a safe place to exercise. Those are right up there as well as we've had for several months now. Gyms closed in the beginning, of course, and back in March. There's even some fresh food shortages as, along with toilet paper and other things. So some of that may come down a bit as, as things ease out there in our communities and the economy. But I think it shows that, and, and certainly our demographics show that a lot of these cut across our, our demographics. And when we look at it by income, for example, wide swaths of the country are dealing with these issues with a few exceptions in terms of the very, very wealthy you know, finding access to food and stuff like that. But even our wealthiest demographics um, had spikes and issues around feelings of loneliness and, and stress and, and the use around technology. Now, of course, I think in, the, in, in other areas where we now have potentially, um, you know, barriers to getting nutritious, nutritious food, the pandemic has really exacerbated those, um, those issues. And so it's something that we're going to have to redouble our efforts on um, as we kind of come out of some of these uh, some of these lockdowns in, in these states. So, Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. See if there's anything else you want to add on social determinants, and then we can move on. Um, no, I think you know the only thing that I would add uh, on that is that you know when we can kind of compare before the pandemic and during the pandemic around the social determinants and the, the challenges. Um, you know, before the pandemic, and we've been doing research on social determinants of health for a while now, um, you know, Americans seem to share some of the same challenges. And what we saw with the pandemic was that it really exploited differences based on income. And so, um, you know, I think that that was a really interesting finding coming out of, of our research. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, and, and this is really around, okay, so what are consumers, how are consumers now feeling about sharing their data um, you know, to further research uh, around COVID-19 in particular, um, and and also, you know, are they are they more willing now to maybe participate in a clinical trial to help develop a treatment or vaccine for for the virus? And so, what you can see on the slide here is um, around data sharing, and and what we found was that consumers are are quite willing now more than more than ever. To, um, to share their data. They're still trusting their doctor the most um, for that. So I think around 80, 84% of, of consumers said that they'd be at least somewhat willing to share the data with their doctors to help discover a new treatment or, or a new way of delivering care. But I thought what was striking is that, um, you know, we always think about, you know, I don't think that that was surprising that the, the doctor, you know, is really, is still really the most trusted uh, with, with patient data. 
But um, what was striking is that 50% of consumers said that they would actually be willing to share their data directly with the drug company um, if it was to you know, further research and develop a treatment or a cure or a vaccine. So uh, really interesting there because if you think about the, um, the doctor has largely been the intermediary between the patient and the drug company as it relates to clinical trials and, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I thought it was very interesting to see that it looks like attitudes are changing around you know, maybe sharing data directly with pharma. Um, not shown on the slide, but, but interesting, uh, we also asked a question about participating in, in a clinical trial and willingness to do that uh, to, for, around COVID-19. And about 58% of consumers said that they would be willing to do that. Um, we looked a little bit further and drilled down to see what would make them more willing to, um, to be involved in a clinical trial. And what was interesting and kind of following along on the, the, the virtual health scene is that the, the factor that was most likely to drive willingness among these consumers uh, to participate in a clinical trial for COVID-19 was the ability to participate from home virtually. Um, and so, I think, you know, really interesting finding there. I know, you know, more and more clinical trials are, are, are moving to be virtual, and certainly during the pandemic, uh, a lot of um, CROs and pharma companies have been looking for ways to make their trials virtual as, as they're able to. Um, but, you know, looking forward, it looks like virtual trials are really, you know, attractive to consumers and, and definitely you know, probably the wave of the future as it relates to, to, research, to clinical research. Back to you, Bob. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a great point, Sarah. Um, you know, as it's not just the delivery system moving to virtual, but also our R&D. Um, and there's a lot, there's many examples of pharmaceutical research that can be done virtually. You know, one simple one is if you think about dermatology, um, and the treatment of, you know, skin issues, a lot of that can be done from the home and then can be done remotely, you know, using a smartphone camera or, or, or video. Um, let's go to our last, this is, this is going to be our last consumer point that we're going to drill down on. And, you know, one thing I'd like to connect it to is the work or at least the goal that the, I'd say the general health system has had over the last few years, which is you know, how can we be a part of consumers' lives when they're outside the four walls of our health system? Um, and I think many health systems and delivery, parts of the delivery system have said, you know, we need to be a part of people's health, not just when they're sick. Um, we need to be a trusted part of their relationship. Well, here's something we can look at to see, you know, is it working? And, and we asked consumers during the pandemic, where are you getting health information about what you should do uh, regarding COVID-19. And there's some very clear clusters here from consumers um, and, th and they're picking their, um, their, where they're getting their information from and then also what, what sources they trust. And at the top, there's a cluster of news and that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, people are getting their news on these 24 hour news channels that are right there. There's another cluster kind of around government, which they're making, you know, one's making pronouncements about opens, openings and closures, what you should do, and, and that's amplified a lot by media. There's a third cluster around kind of what I call our own personal network networks to get information, social media, uh, doing your own research on the internet, your, your family and friends, your personal network. The next was the employer, which we found very surprising of, you know, it's not like a, a, a really large percentage, but it was a higher than we thought in terms of the percent of consumers that say they're getting information about COVID from their employer. And only after I went through that whole list do we actually get to the health system, the primary care doctors, the hospitals, the health systems, the insurance companies, the pharmacists, the specialists, you know, all the way down, they sit pretty low on the in the pecking order of where consumers get information. So I think on one hand, we can look at this like a negative. Um, certainly, I think many health systems and, and physicians are not having as much communication as they think with their uh, patients and consumers, at least the consumers don't think so. But it also shows the opportunity that the system has to be more a part of people's lives. And how could you kind of move farther up that chain, especially Sometimes when there's a lot of disinformation out there and we need the medical health and scientific community 
to be more a part of people's um, discussions. So let me end there with our drill down on consumers. I mentioned at the top of the hour, we gave a lot of numbers, more than you could probably ever write down. Um, and not all of those were in slides for this presentation, but it all is available on our website. And we have different drill down slide decks for payer, provider, pharma, employer, where you can find all of those numbers. But talking about the numbers is never going to be enough. We have to be able to act on it. And that's where we'd like to bring in our colleagues, Sierra and Sundar, to talk about how you can actually act on data and create a response. So Sierra, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. So um, we've heard a lot, uh, you know, over the last few minutes about how COVID is starting to exacerbate trends that we've been seeing already in the healthcare industry. So not just, you know, the role of social determinants of health in informing, uh, you know, different behaviors and potentially health outcomes down the road that we'll see, especially for uh, individuals with chronic conditions, but also uh, differences in response, especially around virtualization of care. Um, so this uh, this problem kind of exacerbates, uh, you know, what we've been trying to solve for in the several years leading up to, uh, you know, COVID-19, um, which is, you know, the need for specificity and uh, a movement away from a one-size-fits-all approach for understanding consumers. So uh, what we've done kind of leading up to this, and, and we never imagined that we would have this type of uh, unfortunate use case uh, to use this tool, um, but we have been on a PDBC side uh, developing out analytics that help us to understand adults across the United States uh, through what's called a synthetic population. So what we've done is used an iterative machine learning approach to stitch together uh, different consumer data sets, including simulations that we've put consumers through in different types of choice making in terms of care venue or in terms of wellness program participation alongside marketing data sets, uh, CDC data sets, geospatial data on, uh, on neighborhoods and social context, um, and stitch that together to kind of form what we call a synthetic record for each individual adult within the U.S. So what that leaves us with is information on psychographics, on behaviors, on uh, social determinants of health within a household and a neighborhood level, as well as health status, so current comorbidities that people are living with for every adult in the US. And so that's allowed us in the context of COVID-19 to be able to assign essentially a risk adjustment score for each adult um, for what we call kind of COVID-19 vulnerability. So this is uh, different from uh, whether or not people are likely to get COVID-19, but rather if they do get it, are they more likely to have a severe outcome? Um, and we're classifying a severe outcome in terms of needing ICU care or needing ventilation or unfortunately passing away. So uh, it's essentially a risk adjustment exercise that we've conducted for each individual based on current smoking behaviors and age, as well as current clinical comorbidities like COPD um, and coronary heart disease, uh, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, malignancy, um, the different factors that have been shown in the medical literature lately um, to be determinant of severe outcomes. So some of the interesting things we found obviously is that that shows a lot of variability in baseline vulnerability of a population. So for example, looking at Manhattan versus the Bronx, um, we all saw kind of what happened when the first wave of COVID-19 infection hit, um, that we saw a disproportionate amount of death and hospitalization among people in the Bronx and Queens. And one of the things that we noticed when we were actually evaluating uh, those different populations using this synthetic population approach before anyone was infected there is we saw over 26% difference in the risk of vulnerability between Manhattan and the Bronx and Queens. So it was a much higher burden of chronic conditions and smoking behaviors that led to a higher vulnerability risk among those populations um, in the Bronx and in Queens. Um, and when we look at that across the country today, we do see variation in terms of race, and we see an extreme variation in terms of income, where the lowest income brackets, similar to other health outcomes, are, are showing the highest level of vulnerability, um, even before we start to see uh, infections and hospitalizations hit the books in terms of actual data. So that'll be a really interesting th thing for us to continue to watch. Um, and other, you know, another thing for us to continue to kind of act against 
as we're preparing, you know, individual level responses and kind of targeted responses for different zip codes, you know, both in urban areas that are just uh, still experiencing or beginning to experience COVID-19 infection peaks, as well as the suburban rural areas that are going to be impacted in the coming weeks and months. So um, there's going to be, you know, a, a bit of discussion that my colleague Sundar is going to take you through in terms of how, you know, this synthetic population approach and the ability to kind of drill down to greater specificity, understand drivers of behaviors um, within those synthetic population, uh, synthetic adults, uh, and, you know, other you know, projected changes to behavior in the context of, of new environments and new drivers um, will manifest themselves in different COVID-19 uh, decision-making contexts. So I'll hand off to Sundar um, and then we can kind of answer questions later. Yeah, thanks, Sierra. So um, really, as we go from those preferences, you saw the data from the consumer surveys, um, and as Sierra talked about the, the individual decision making, it couldn't be, um, you know, more pronouncedly different in uh, than times like these, where it's really um, the the type of uh, social demographic and you know health factors that play into like where people get their information, how they process it, who they trust, and how they make decisions from it. Um, and, uh, and the example in New York is a great one where we saw the differences in severity play out in terms of, um, you know, between zip codes that are just a few miles apart on the level of severity and the need for the, um, you know, health system um, supplies in hospital beds and ICUs being playing out very differently beyond just how you think about how, you, how one would think about just the disease progression itself. <clears throat> so what, um, as we think about that, we think every organization has to make decisions in line with these, um, you, you know, in alignment with how the consumers um, are thinking about making decisions as well as how, um, you, you know, really that impacts businesses. And, um, you know, as uh, mentioned at the top of the call, to really um, get at the disparities that's driving the outcomes that are different by zip code, communities, nursing homes, et cetera, right? Um, so as we shift from the consumer to, 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 to really align system decisions into consumer decision making, we think about three levels of the questions that businesses are thinking about. Um, the strategic, the operational, and the financial. Then the strategic side is really now how will, um, you know, how will we be, how, how should organization help be prepared for still we are um, going through the peaks. There's a lot of questions about secondary peaks and how the COVID disease itself, the progression will happen, but also beyond that, how the recovery scenarios may play out and how the new normals will look like when um, when we come out of this and what's the potential impact to the communities um, and the behaviors short and long term and uh, in terms of operational really how to allocate resources to manage that efficiently as these uncertainties pay, you know play out in the short term as well as you know as the new normal settle right and then the financial implications of this many of the health systems for instance we talked to <clears throat> that even haven't seen much of covid are already experiencing pretty significant financial losses, right? Given all the um, quote unquote um, electives that are non COVID uh, volumes dropped. So that's leading to pretty significant financial distress in the system itself. And how that will play out um, is, is going to take a um, longer, longer term to, to settle. So as we think about that, if we go to the next page, we think of the consumer, the consumer decision making is part of an ecosystem of, um, you know, predictive approaches that uh, that will need to really be modeled and thought through as any organization makes decisions. If the top layer we think about is really three things, the health and the disease modeling, so which is really as it sounds, um, as new information comes out and mobility changes, how does the COVID um, progression itself happen? And what about the non-COVID situations, right? I mean, we were in a discussion system. There is actually worries around, for instance, 
people deferring vaccinations around measles and others that could also start playing out in terms of longer term health issues that can come about which are not which are impact of covid but are not directly covid themselves so it's really the disease progression the second factor is really around the economic so uh, more than 35 million people now are out of work and so the insurance implications and the shifts um from you know small group and large group employer based coverage to um individual and medicaid or even uninsured now with some short term products um play significantly into also the decision making of the consumers and um their um, their outlook and the third thing it's uh, third thing is directly the what we've talked about and Sierra talked through on in terms of the consumer decision making on behaviors right on when they are ready to i think of this as you know every every one of us have different levels of preferences inclinations to really now go approach any the, the health system right so in a 2 by 2 of anxiety versus urgency it really depends on the urgency and the need of the care and and or the pain i'm suffering as a result of not having the care um and then the other dimension being really the um anxiety i have in terms of going back out into a hospital or a healthcare setting and um and some consumers are much more willing and ready and others are not right it depends really on a lot of different factors so when we take all these three things together the disease the economic and the consumer decision making modeling together it starts getting at then uh, what might be expected uh, scenarios that could play out in terms of um anything right in terms of volume of services to come back in terms of um, company level revenues or impacts to margin and at a company level the strategic the operational and the financial are laid out here as the you know the impact simulation scenario planning for the strategic the operational really being around the workforce and the um supplies in the facilities and everything that's needed by skill type or a number of availability etc and then the uh financial really around the financial scenarios but also <clears throat> what the trends look like over over time period um if you go to the I'll round out in the last page so so really we think there's not a one size fits all answer taking these things together and being able to um model and align the organization to act on insights coming out of it and adjust in a real time basis really will make the difference um between um successful outcomes and uh not so successful ones right and so what we had um uh seeing is that different health systems payers and um uh pharma and employers are using this information in different ways to manage the business health systems being most immediately est- estimating and adjusting for capacities that are local zip code level and for starting to forecast and plan for how to really reactivate the volume um in alignment with the consumer's preferences and our our decision making and designing newer pathways and interventions right to really make them feel safer and um uh, um you know starting to address their needs in the way that they want to live their life and designing strategies and financial plans and resource plans against that with the insurance and the payer side it's much more around the employer member mix shift but also starting to forecast how this could impact the financials and how they can work with providers health systems and others at a local and a uh, macro level to really uh, deliver on the care that's required right and the coverage and for pharma it's much more around really how to plan for the local demand for the drugs and the distribution and the value chain side as well as evolving to better um, strategies for future right and the uh, r&d and drug discovery space as well and employers really how to you know much more critical for small employers around like how do we how do they even decide about coverage for the future when it becomes so mission critical and then uh, for larger and other employers really using scenario planning and different approaches to manage the workforce health and productivity coming out of this so with that we wanted to save time for questions so i'll pause that and uh, we we will be on for taking any questions here great has been fantastic. So why don't we get everybody's um video back up here? Uh Ben, you can rejoin us here. It'd be great to see you. Sundar great um presentations. 
One thing I would love to go back to is there are a lot of questions around the information you presented around where people get their health information. So I think this relates to you, Ben and Sarah. Fortunately, we don't have Sarah. We have Sarah on the phone, but we don't have Sarah's um, video stream, but she is with us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I thought was really interesting was you talked about where people get their health information and it looked like news and national networks was where people were getting it. And you, you um, equated that to um, trust, really. So, um, and I'm curious if you think that um, people are getting their information there because it's more easily accessible or do you think it's because those are the, um, you know, folks that they trust more? Just curious of your thoughts. Yeah. No, Jen, I think that's a great question. I, you know, I, all of our consumer surveys over the years, I think there's one thing that's been very steady and that's consumers' trust of their primary care physician. Uh, and I, I don't think that's going away anytime soon. So I, I think there is an accessibility issue about just where people get information. And we, we do have some additional insights just from the consumer survey in terms of, you know, it's not monolithic. I mean, we're, we're obviously giving just the top line Right. Um, but there, but there were some differences. And Sarah, I didn't know if you wanted to maybe sure. talk about a few of those differences around communication. Yes. Well, so I think you know some of the questions that that we've gotten um, in the past are around. So if you know for, we're the more, more vulnerable consumers, so those with chronic illness, et cetera, mental illness, um, were they more likely to have heard from their from their physician or from their health system or their insurer? And they were slightly more likely to be to have heard from them, but not not notably. So it was still less than a fifth. Um, if you looked across those that are considered vulnerable, you know, related to health or related to you know age, they still um, did not receive. You know, the, it was just still a fifth of them compared to about 14 percent overall um, that had heard from, you know, that had had outreach from directly from the health system. Um, I think one really interesting factor, and we were kind of looking at this by, um, you know, by health status, was that the those um, with a mental illness were um, very were not likely at all to have gotten any information from their insurer. That was um, I thought pretty striking. Um, but um, so, so we did see some differences, but. Um, you know, across the board, really, you know, and I think it's been said, you know, the primary care physician is is still seen as a, you know, top trusted source for health information. Um, so, you know, I think there's a big opportunity for the health system and for insurers to, um, you know, be able to, to really target, per, you know, different populations that they serve, especially the vulnerable ones, and, and really put together some more customized advice, I think, for them um, as it relates to all this. You know, Sarah, one of the comments we got from one of the attendees today is that, you know, for the general population, it would maybe make sense that they would be um, choosing their mm -hmm. news sources from the, you know, general cable news or the government, but maybe for patients who have chronic conditions or complex conditions, they're more likely to go to a health system or their PCP. I'm just, if you have any thoughts on that. Right, and that, and that is what we, we found to be not true, what we would have thought that as well. But um, in terms of yeah. Yeah. where they were. Yeah. Yeah, a, it was really just a slight change. I think, wow. you know, Sarah, I think you were saying it was, went between what, 14 and 20%. So it, it was not a big right. jump on with people who have chronic conditions. You know, anecdotally, this is not from our survey, but when we've talked to people to drill down a little bit about who are they hearing from in the health community, you know, a lot of it is kind of some of the new retail, urgent care, concierge type medicine organizations that were set up with, a, you know, a digital, you know, they have from the very beginning an app, online check-in, you know, right. all of these things. And so communication is very, you know, there's a communication track for them that's very easy. It's really the traditional health systems that, I mean, we talked to people who said they didn't hear anything for like six weeks from their doctor, from their, their hospital and so that's, I think that's really the, the point we're trying to make here is there's a huge amount of opportunity there. Yeah. Another question is around um, the access. So you guys did a great job of sharing how people are using um, telehealth now. And I love the mental health statistic you said about um, people keeping their appointments more often. 
um, and mental health through mm -hmm. telehealth visits. Did you guys find any other specific demographics in terms of, you know, we always get, people are always wondering, are older adults less likely to be using this telehealth now? Are they having more trouble? Or are there other specific demographics, you know, where the younger millennials just, you know, using this much more? Did you see any kind of differences in the demographics there in terms of who's using these virtual um, delivery methods? Yes, we did. We did, um, and I can I can say by age, um, I think forty five percent were over the age of forty five. Um, kind of looking at it overall, uh, the new you know new users to telehealth were more likely to be white. They were more likely to have employer employer based insurance, and they were more likely to be from a household with a hundred hundred thousand or more in income. Um, it's just you know a couple more lenses to look at that data through. Yeah, the, the one the one thing Sarah I was thinking of though is we we did see a pretty a pretty good percentage from Medicare and you know if I think back to pre-COVID mm -hmm. telehealth use from Medicare I think MedPAC one time pegged it at like one percent of Medicare users had used telehealth as of like a year ago. I remember that vaguely from a MedPAC report. Um, and Sarah, I don't have it in front of me. What was it? I, I, I just grabbed it. It was 19% um, okay. of the new users yep. were Medicare. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. That's great. Um, Sundar, Sierra, so the, the model you presented is incredible. I mean, it's <laughs> robust. I haven't seen anything that pulls in all those different pieces. Can you talk about how organizations are using this model now? I mean, clearly it's a, a new, COVID is new, but um, you know, what, what are some of the things you've been able to do pulling these pieces together with the model? Do you have any good examples of companies that have used it and how it's kind of played out? Yeah, sure. So we've, I, we've used... Oh, sorry, the, go ahead, Sundar. No, I, so the two pieces, I would say, the first one is really immediate and here um, in the last few weeks has been, at a, when you think about as COVID started hitting, the capacity planning for PPE, the beds and the ICUs happen at a zip code level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, while generally in the news there has been progression models that are still the best, you know, there's national level projections or state level projections, but you really have to get down to zip code hospital level in order for it to be actionable for plants. And that's one place that people have used it really well. And the other one is really much more on the recovery side. Now, the big question is, um, as, you know, in some of these jobs, at least people start to uh, think about getting back to normal, what would the, um, you know, the planning and the demand look like for the other service, other non-COVID electives or other services look like and how to really manage that? And that's another place. But Sierra, go ahead. Are there other use cases you want to add? I just going to indicate um, we've been thinking about it uh, and using it for more individualized outreach, too. So if you identify people who are at high risk of uh, having a, developing a severe outcome and they're in geography where they're at high risk of actually getting, uh, getting COVID-19, then that's kind of a perfect intersection for proactive outreach. So if you also understand what their contact channel preference is and, and the stakeholders that they tend to trust, some of which might be outside of the formal medical system, that's really important in, in figuring out how you actually target, you know, either through SMS or through app-based uh, or email-based outreach or even through community health workers, depending on the population. So it's really a great population health tool, I mean, for organizations to use to find those at-risk. Yeah. Groups. Yeah. And it's been exciting to see that bridge to even things like food insecurity and to transportation barriers, which also bridge to other things like chronic disease management. Yeah, it's interesting how much this whole conversation dovetails with the um, disparities conversation and social determinants of health and um, it all comes full circle. I think Ben was mentioning that earlier. It's really, um, it's all related. One of the things, um, you know, I'm curious about just your perspective, Ben, is, you know, given all this telehealth, what is the future going to be for in-person visits? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I think I think that's kind of the question everyone's trying to figure out right now. Um, you know, how much of this you know continues, and and how does it truly change the delivery system? I think there's a, a a couple of missing links that still have to be figured out. I think one is around ancillary services, and so 
Um, you know, many health systems have already experienced this as they've moved more to telehealth. They've actually lost a lot of volume and revenue on the ancillary side. Uh, but some of those ancillary services are probably actually really needed, right? I mean, people need x-rays and blood work done and, and, right. and you know, other types of imaging. And so the question is going to be is, what's that combination going to look like for the consumer? Uh, and how can we make it more seamless? And is the system we have right now for ancillaries, is that really the one that's going to kind of win out the day in a, in, a, in a more of a virtual health world? And so we can imagine... What of that is going to be able to come into the home? What of that is going to be come into some sort of centralized area that's maybe closer to the consumer than in the traditional hospital campus? What does that look like? What are those combinations? I think there's a lot of question marks out there. I think we'll see a lot of experimentation um, around that. I don't think we're going to go backwards. I mean, we may see some volumes come down a bit when people can go back in person, but we've just had too many clinicians and too many consumers who have now had the experience and like the experience and see when it's a valuable tool to use for it to go completely backwards. Yeah. Is there anything in the data, Sarah, that surprised you that you were like, oh my gosh, that's totally not what I thought. Uh, let's see. I think, that, well, I mean, I think the communication on is a big one. I was very surprised by that. Um, I think, you know, also around telehealth, it's the fact that, you know, and, and maybe it is that those with chronic diseases, you know, had more appointments scheduled that they needed, you know, to take care of and could through telehealth, but it just the, really the, the shift from really thinking about telehealth as just being for the common cold and, and looking at, and it's something that we've been tracking for a while, you know, there's been a lot of willingness among consumers with chronic disease um, to use you know, to use uh, telehealth, but we really haven't at, until this point actually, um, you know, had the, the utilization. You know, the utilization has been so low up until now. Um, so that was a, a, a big, um, you know, big surprise and, and uh, really, you know, something that I was happy to see because, um, you know, we've, we've been saying for so long that, you know, a lot of these chronic visits, routine visits can be handled via telehealth. Um, and, um, and so maybe, maybe that that will be the future. Yeah, and one thing I might add to that, I mean, I think we came up in the question, right, where are people getting their information and how do they make decisions? Mm -hmm. It, you know, typically, and we do many consumer surveys, you know, the they typically task their providers and docs with a lot of healthcare decisions when it seems like that, you know, you see at least there is a very much basis for where they're getting the information. It's perhaps because there is a lot of it that comes through local and um, national news channels, channels yeah. but it still doesn't mean where, when we go back to the new normal, how does that translate into trust and how do they make healthcare decisions beyond COVID? That is something that is very much out in the open for grabs by other people now than just the traditional healthcare providers. One thing I'm interested in is as people are using more of these virtual tools, you know, I know in um, previous surveys, you guys have asked about how interested people are in accessing their information online. Um, curious if you think all of this virtual experience is going to, um, I don't know if people be more interested in checking out what's in their <laughs> EHR or their portal, or do you think that that kind of like flows over a little bit into that? You think people would be more interested in accessing that data or they're just still? Um... Well, I, I can speak a little bit to that because we already saw with, and one thing we probably didn't mention, um, with these new telehealth users is that 94% of them, I think, I might have the off by a couple percentage points there, but uh, an overwhelming majority, I mean, almost all of them said that they would use it again. And so that leads me to believe that, you know, the more people that get exposure to these alternative ways of, you know, receiving care or receiving information or accessing information, um, the more, you know, the more we're going to see that grow and the, the demand, I think, that we're, we're going to see for that. Yeah. And the other thing I would add to that is just the access issue. I think, I think many consumers experienced over the last three months what it's like when you don't have unfettered access to the health system. And so, you know, and, and, and or the health system is really busy with other things, like very important things like a pandemic. And so, right. you know, you're, 
you know, your immunization records and just be able to access things when you don't have those normal channels, people do have to rely more on the electronic uh, digital channels. And so we, we probably have some more users there, even though we did not specifically survey consumers on are, are they using portals and, you know, accessing data more. I think we could probably infer that some of that will be happening. You know, I think it's interesting that um, Sundar, your um, model uses so many different pieces of information. And are those pieces of information more readily available right now to pull down? I mean, I would think some of those, I mean, certainly zip codes would be easy to find, but like some of the economic information and the others, you know, how do you really, how do you get that and pull that in? Yeah, great question. I think Sierra talked through the data sources. Um, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of data sources that are available publicly, but it takes a lot of effort to curate them and get it to a point where you can actually, um, you know, help um, predict the decision making at an individual level, which is what we've invested the time and effort in, and uh, frankly, much more, much before COVID because for population health and engaging consumers, it's much more important to play at that level. And it just happens that as COVID came along, the data set was helpful, but it's been curated over years. Uh, but for simpler decision-making, I think just look, there are public sources of information that could be used. Um, it just takes investment and effort to curate them. Yeah, and uh, a really easy source, you know, for those who are looking to get a, a fast answer for higher level population statistics has obviously been, you know, the, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. So I think, um, you know, that, that helps in terms of understanding really employment types, you know, and, and density of employment type. And there are secondary resources around how vulnerable each of those employment types are to, um, to shocks right now um, and, and where we might see those changes. And so, so it's definitely an interesting way to see around the curve a bit and, and that can be overlaid with even exposure types by employment sector um, for COVID-19. So some, some folks are getting a double whammy right now. Yeah. Um, ben, one last question for you. So, <laughs> um, you know, all of this change has taken place. Um, consumers have changed their behavior because there's been a, a massive pandemic. Um, so if, you know, the next thing comes down the line in healthcare technology, whatever that might be, um, you know, are we going to have to have a pandemic to get everybody to change their behavior? I mean, I think this, if anything, um, you know, I think we're all very happy that this behavior has been adopted so quickly. But what does that say about, um, you know, us in the healthcare or technology industry? Well, I think I think one lesson that we can take from it is that, uh, you know, there, there's a stickiness to the health system because it's a complicated system by design. And so consumers tend to kind of stick with what they know and what's worked. And they're often less apt to try something different because of that. And, and the stakes are so high. Um, and so, you know, kind of necessity was the mother of invention on this one. And all of a sudden when you don't have a choice, all these people who had, you know, like, oh, I should try that sometime, but they've got to download an app. They're not sure if their employer covers it. I mean, there's all these kind of questions that always hang out there. And those questions were answered very quickly during the pandemic. So, I, I mean, I think, to, I, I think to answer the question very directly, I don't know if it will take a pandemic for adoption, but um, it often takes something that just makes it so clear that this is the easier path for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once that is known, and that could be an external disaster, but that could also be just internally, the technology is so amazing that everyone's friends tells them you've got to do this. You know, it's that's those are the tipping points that I think we're always looking for. Yeah, that's a great lesson to take away from this. Um, all right. Well, we are a couple minutes over, but I do want to thank our panelists today. I think this has been a really fabulous session and we had great questions from everyone. There have been a lot of questions about more detail in the survey and we've sent out a link to the PwC site where you can download that. And we will also be sending out a follow up email with more links to these resources because they have a slew of <laughs> um, detail and background on these reports that you're going to want to get your hands on. So we'll send that out to everybody as well. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Today, and please stay um, healthy and safe in your homes and we'll see you later this week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.